Lovely. Okay. So hello, everybody. Today is Friday, the 28th of October. My name is Connor Rafey. I'm currently studying a foundation degree in media, and my chosen subject is film and television. This is for creative professional practice. Uh, we've come, we have to complete 90 hours of work experience, my main one being uh, the wedding videographer I have tomorrow that I'm documenting at the moment. And my second one is the uh, Zoom call with voice actor. So uh, today I have the pleasure of introducing Jason Anthony. Hello, how are you? I'm very well, Connor. Thanks for having me. Fantastic. No problem at all. Um, so Jason, he has starred in films such as Marmaduke. Piney the Lonesome Pine, Lego Star Wars, The Empire Strikes Out, which is one of my favourites as I did grow Ooh, up watching. Nice. <laughs> <laughs> Great. I did love that. I loved it. Um, you voice uh, characters in worldwide popular games, Call of Duty, as I did see on TikTok. Um, the uh, Otter, that's great. I love I love your, uh, your thing of that. That was absolutely fantastic. Um, nice one. Which sort of leads me into sort of how how I came about this. It was um, a few years ago, I think during the lockdown. Um, obviously, before I'd really made any films, um, I came across. Um, I think it was your your TikTok and then your your Instagram. You were suddenly trending, and I and I saw you doing the Odeon impressions. I saw I saw um, you playing Otter and sort of saying I played um, the person uh, Star Wars Empire Strikes Out, and I thought wow, this is absolutely fantastic. I was like, wow, and I was keeping up with it for a few weeks. It was fun to have a look now and then. And then right. it came to my uh, my, my uh, documentary, The Global Crisis, that I did, um, which is about the pandemic. And I, and I thought, you know, long shot, but I wonder if uh, he'd be interested in maybe just reading a little uh, little part for me to put into it, because I just thought it was such an incredible voice. I thought I had to, you know, you never know until you, until you ask. So... Um, and I did, yeah. and you very happily recorded that for me, which I'm again so grateful for. Um, I hope you enjoyed it. <laughs> yeah, it was a lot, it was a beautiful piece. I mean, I think I I think I my professional head get I I don't not sure if I even gave you two takes, but I think it was around the time I'd recently lost my father. We were going through this, you know, this uh, incredibly strange time in in history uh, for all of us, and and I. You know, my emotions got the better of me, but I thought, well, let me just leave it in. And if you need need something else, I'll I'll be happy yeah. to do it. But you know, uh, you you put it in warts and all, and and I and I think really as as just a starting point from from an an actor's side, um, you don't plan to do stuff like that. But if it happens, it's kind of like. A, a genuine moment so I, I appreciated that you as a as a filmmaker as well recognized that and and felt no I'm just going to leave that in you know my voice was breaking and yeah you know all those things that you think even as a as a, a narrator oh that's unprofessional but you know if the piece uh is compelling enough which yours was I I, I think you know uh it was uh, a a good decision probably to just leave that in yeah that 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 was my exact um thought process I, I do remember you saying if you'd like me to record another one I'd happily do it. it was a bit choked up at the end but I thought you know when you get those sort of you know uh sort of films for example ones that work so well is when everything fits into place when you've got a great script great cinematography great score so I think you know it was like okay you know it was about the pandemic really relevant yeah. obviously at the time and yeah. I thought you know the the emotion you know, it, it needed to, it, I needed to show it. I was like, you know, that, that, that's what the, the, the poetic documentary was about, you know, and I, and I yeah. did, it was, it was, um, yeah. So, so I really appreciated you doing that. And then we went on to uh, the quarantine couple, the third lockdown that I did, which was the second one, which after a year from making my first one, I thought I'll go back. I'd done uh, half of my diploma. So I thought I'll use the skills to uh, make another one. And I yeah. thought, obviously I watched, um, I think it was the Royal Tenenbaums and then I watched something else as well that had a narration in it and obviously my inspiration was Wes Anderson and I thought you know I'm going to be sneaky and I'd love to do him to do another another <laughs> um, another little narration in it and you again happily agree to that um, and that was fantastic and then finally um, which was my little experimental project for my degree I did uh, Bullet Man while I was researching comic book characters and and I found sort of like, you know, the, the Thanos version of the DC in sort of um, in, in Bullet Man universe and found someone called Metron. And I thought, 
that would be fantastic. I heard, I said, I, I heard you did, it was like a, there was a Venom impression you did in an Optimus Prime one and, and I saw oh, yeah. into it and I thought, uh, we've got to like put that together and make and do something. It would be fantastic. <laughs> so, um, so yeah, that was absolutely fantastic. So that's a little bit of background on sort of, you know, um, how I sort of got to know you. And again, I do really appreciate you sort of keeping in touch as well over the last few years. It's been, it's been really good. And it's really sort of given me that boost, you know, that the, the, there's oh, someone there to sort of help me along the way. So, so I, I really do appreciate oh, that. That's really nice. Thanks, Connor. Thank you. So I just want to start off with a uh, sort of first question. So um, most importantly, when was it that you realised at the start when you when you were younger that this was what you wanted to do as, as, as a career? How did it come up, voice acting? Um, my father was a salesman, very, very successful salesman, went on to be a sales director. Um, I had no outside influence in my family uh, in any way, shape or form in, in entertainment business. But I found very early on in, in school, well, I say early on, I was probably 15. Mm. Um, and we were doing a drama class and um, I I wasn't really into it, but we would do it. In a, I don't know if you know the movie Bugsy Malone with all the yes. cast with yes. Jodie Foster and stuff. A fantastic movie yeah, film yeah, yeah. at Pinewood Studios, all child actors playing adults. Yeah. Um, and, and our school decided to put that on as a production. And we were in drama class, which was, you know, you, you had to take drama class. It wasn't a, a, yeah. a choice. And I remember her just randomly picking me out saying, can you read the lines for Fat Sam, which was one of the, the lead characters. And I read this and, uh, you know, it went down pretty well. Yeah. And uh, again, I didn't even want to audition for it. Um, and I ended up being the understudy for Fat Sam. But then by the time it got to production, um, they decided that I would do half the nights and the other guy would do the other half of the nights. Right. So that was my first introduction. It never really had been on my radar other than my absolute love and fascination and joy watching movies. You know, yeah. I would really be one of those kids that would just get lost in in movies. Yeah. Um, but unfortunately, when I left school, that was kind of like, well, that was school. That was part of school. And, I, and, and I'm sure a lot of people relate to that. It's like, well, those were my school days. And now it's now it's work. Yeah. And the, the only point of reference I had for that was my dad. So I I went into sales and I did it for many, many years, but I wasn't happy. Mm. And some people make a change early on. I left it probably, it was never too late, but I left it probably a good 10 years after leaving school. And I, and I just had this epiphany one day. I was reading some self-help books and things along the way. And I really just felt like, oh, my gosh, am I really going to do this for the rest of my life? Like, I, 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 I don't wake up with any kind of passion. I, I don't like this line of work, I, you know. So yeah. it was around my mid twenties that I started rocking the, the the boat a bit and thought, no, I I I really did enjoy those times at school performing, uh, and then a, a bit of serendipity pops in, and and I happened to have this dinner one night uh, at a friend's house, and I was sat next to one of the TV presenters uh, from a very very popular BBC show uh, called Tomorrow's World. Uh, it was all about, you know, uh, uh, science and uh, um, the future kind of stuff. Yeah. H hence tomorrow's world. <laughs> um, and it wasn't yesterday's. <laughs> um, and, and we just started chatting and, and he, he, I guess he picked up on, you know, my personality. Um, and I think the sales stuff helped me because I had to do a lot of presentations and stuff. So he picked up on that and he said, do you want to, you know, do you want to come and do the BBC training course? Um for, for presenters. So I did. And, and that really started the ball rolling. Um, and again, acting wasn't really on the radar at that point at all. It was yeah. all about being a TV presenter. And again, you know, by luck, a, a friend of mine um, said, hey, you're doing some presenting stuff, aren't you? And I said, yeah. They said, Disney are looking for uh, uh, some presenters for their new Playhouse Disney channel for preschool. Yeah. So I went and auditioned for that and, and fortunately got that role. Um, and that was working with kids and storytelling. And that's when I first did voiceover. 
because mm. we would do some stuff in studio and then I would actually just narrate the stories to animation after that. Yeah. Um, and then really sort of s skipping a few beats, I went on to to to, to work with ITV2 and ITV1 as, as the continuity uh, announcer for them, live continuity announcer, announcing for a few years. Yeah. And then yeah. a friend of mine said, hey, you should, you know, why don't you check out L.A.? And really, it's only until I came to L.A., that um and i'm missing out a lot of details here but <laughs> brief stuff but get, coming to la was really when i started to think uh more on the acting side um and specifically voice acting because i came over here to narrate a couple of shows for e entertainment but, but then my agent was putting me up for video games and putting me up right. for animation um yeah, yeah. hence you know the lego star wars stuff and hero factory and and things like that so yeah it was it's it's uh probably not a, an unusual journey uh, but also not a typical journey of you know uh of, of getting to where i am now yeah yeah of course yeah well like i said like like you said you know everyone sort of has their own story of how they came into it you know um and i think yeah this is sort of fam it's quite familiar but also it's your own story you know uh, yeah, exactly. And it, it, it's also really, you know, listening to your body, you know, there's a, a you know, your the, the body uh, uh, keeps the, the, the score kind of thing. It's yeah. like really listening to your body and thinking like, I'm not happy. I'm not, I'm not fulfilled here. Yeah. And, and, and that should be the kind of, you know, the lighting of the fuse. It's not necessarily the be all and end all, but that should be, the lighting of the fuse to think okay i need to do something about this and do yeah. something you know because it, it just seems tragic to not do something you absolutely love and i think we live yeah. in a time now with social media and tiktok you know you really can just put it all out there for the world yeah. to see yeah, yeah 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 well sort of touching on the subject of that yeah when you talk about sort of, you know, you, you were getting these roles and a friend had said about this role and, you, and you're auditioning for stuff, how do you deal with sort of, um, you know, the, the, the knockbacks and the setbacks? Because a lot of people can struggle with sort of, you know, taking those knockbacks, I didn't get this part, you know, I yeah. did for this, got sent away, something like that. You know, some people can go, that's fine, next one. But some people can really struggle. I mean, I've I've struggled, you know, now now and then, and, and and had to sort of, you know, seek help for that and seeing how how can I just go look. That's it. Next one. There's more opportunities to come, you know. And that came with just chatting to people. So for you, sort of, how did you deal with those sort of knockbacks and setbacks? Yeah, I mean, you know, there's some tough ones. I you're gonna get way more no's than yeses, and that's just fact. It, it is for everyone. Um, I think you it's also tests your your passion and your will to to do whatever it is you're setting out to do. And this doesn't just apply to entertainment industry. It applies to starting a small business, anything. There are going to be so many knockbacks. But sometimes those knockbacks are what get you to the next level mm. because you either take them as literally a knockback and just think, oh, well, you know, you know, or what can I learn from this? Mm. you know um what what did, what did i do right what did i do wrong and sometimes you've done nothing wrong you're just not especially uh, you know more for entertainment stuff you're yeah. just not the fit it doesn't mean you've done anything wrong because a, a lot of the times you know with casting they don't have an absolute clear vision of what they are either looking for or listening for yeah but they they'll know it when they walk through the door or when they hear it in their headphones. Yeah. Um, it's a bit like uh, the the piney character I auditioned for, the Christmas tree. Yeah. What does a Christmas tree sound like? <laughs> Hopefully nobody knows because otherwise you've got to talk in Christmas tree. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so that was a classic. And I remember talking to the creator and they, they said we we didn't know what to put other than this ageless voice. Well, what is it? ageless voice it's yeah, like that's yeah, a real yeah. tricky one so she said you know we'll know it when we hear it and i think with all these sort of setbacks you could you know you can only do a certain amount of preparation um in the time scale 
you don't want to overthink it creatively because then you're thinking too much and you're yeah. just, you're, you're um, smothering your creativity. So you just do the, the the best at the time and what instinctively comes to you and what feels right. And a lot of the times when I do auditions, I kind of listen back and and I think, well, that's funny. Or yeah, I I, I think I for me, if I heard that, that that's great. And that's all you can do, and you yeah. send it off. Yeah. Um, and I I really do think at that point of sending it off it's also kind of emotionally sending it off it's yeah. out there it's done it now it it might be great and you're perfect for, for that role and if you're not it doesn't mean that that person who's listened to that isn't thinking of you for something else mm. so they're all ripples in the pond and, yeah. and some hit the other side and bounce back and some just go on forever yeah. You know, and, and that's the way really to look at it and never fool yourself that, you know, well, I'm definitely going to get more yeses than those. No, yeah. it, it yeah. literally it's just doesn't it doesn't work like that, um, you know. So it's really about not taking it personally, um, what you can learn from it. And, you know, deep down, OK, I, you know, I didn't prepare for that as best as I could. Yeah. You know? Or, or um, you know, well, maybe I just sometimes you can overthink things, too. Yeah. You know? Yeah. yeah. Um, I, I think a lot, especially on, on the creative side, when you look at things, sometimes you think, wow, how? And I'm thinking even from a design point, you look at people's logos and things, you think, gosh, what a simple design. Yeah. But it works. And yeah. I think the same thing can can be for, for everything, you know, directors, actors. Uh, uh, sound engineers you can literally overthink something yeah and just miss that pure simplicity of wow that that works that's yeah that's it that's all they yeah. needed to do you know yeah yeah so it does sort of lead me on to my next question that actually um when you sort of speak about sort of sort of these roles and that how, how do, 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 with some people I've seen with voice acting obviously you're not sometimes working with people are you in like a separate studio are you sort of do you just get given lines to someone read the character's lines for you how, how do you get into that sort of mindset yeah that's a great question Connor I really wish it was an ensemble group every single time <laughs> yeah. but it unfortunately it, it's not and it's it's partly down to scheduling and getting everyone in the room at the same time yeah of course yeah. um but uh, with sound, as you know, sound is, is a very complicated beast and, and overlooked tremendously. Um, and if it's done right, you don't even think about it. Yeah. Um, and when you're recording uh, voices, characters, people need those clear um, records completely separately without any other room tone or coughs or anyone talking over you. Because it's then, you know, the editor's, the director's choice then of what to put together. Um, yeah. Case in point, uh, when I did a, a, a duet with Simon Pegg, um, we weren't even, even in the same country, uh, let alone the same time. I recorded my lines, he recorded his, and they put them together and we're singing a duet. Yeah. Um, oh, wow. So it's very rare that you are in a room together. I did some work on uh, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles and I was with the other uh, the other turtles, which was really awesome. But yeah. even then, we, we all had these giant big... We were in one studio, but mm. we had big giant screens. Uh, we were all in our little glass boxes within a box. Yeah, yeah, so yeah. That, so that you don't get any of that spillage onto your mic because you know, microphones are very, very sensitive things. Mm. Um, and, uh, you know, when you're recording with a group of people, there's all sorts of ambient noise that can leak into your record. So it's partly a scheduling thing and it's more a technical thing that you yeah. don't record together, which is a real, it is a shame because when you do, oh my gosh. I mean, I did a, a show on HBO um, called The Life and Times of Tim um with alfred molina and it was i mean it was just fantastic we had about there was kari walgren in there uh steve dildary and the creator who was hilarious <laughs> um and there was about five of us in there and it was an improvised scene it, the oh, show yeah. was yeah the show was mostly improvised right and we had so much fun i bet yeah, I mean, yeah. yeah. but unfortunately it's not the norm yeah 
Yeah, I had no idea. I mean, you say about the Simon Pegg thing, that's crazy. It is crazy. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, and you know, and as you say about somebody reading your lines, no, no, you I... just literally, you literally have to, and that's why with voiceover specifically, you really have to create those environments and create those feelings in your head. So you, nobody's reading you a line in. Um, occasionally when you do video games, somebody might read a, a line in for you. Um, but it's, it's quite, quite rare. You're literally thinking, right, I'm coming off of this. You know, somebody says, you can't go in there. Yeah, but, but, but why? I want to go in yeah. there. Yeah, yeah, you yeah. Know, you've literally just got to play that in your head. You know, um, you can do uh, what they call uh, something they call pre-life. Right. And that, that's a little moment. It's not necessarily dialogue even. Pre-life is just like, oh, wow. Yeah. Ah, I had no idea. You know, rather than just going, I had no idea. You can do a little pre-life, a breath, right. or a wow, or, yeah, or something yeah, yeah. like that. And, and sometimes they keep it in and sometimes they don't. But yeah. you have to, even then, you have to give them the little space. You can't go, wow, I thought I'd... You have to give them a, wow, this is amazing. And then yeah. they've got the choice of putting it in together yeah. or not. Right. So it's all all little technical things that... Yeah, yeah. You have, yeah. To, uh, you have to be thinking about, but also don't think about them because you're yeah. there to 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 yeah. react you know we, you were talking about sort of having sort of the fun times on set and the stories and that have, what has been your 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 favorite uh, sort of you know film to either you know do a voice in you know or, or, or what's your favorite set working with people um gosh there's the uh well certainly with alfred molina that was that was very special because mm. one it was working with uh, fred and uh, he was lovely. He yeah. just said, hello, I'm Fred. And yeah. I'm like, wow. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. Yes, you are. Um, <laughs> I think what's also a lovely bit of magic as well is like when I did Hero Factory, mm. um, I had no idea of, of the scope of the cast because, again, I was bought in separate. And, you know, you, you had Jennifer Coolridge. You had Tom Kenny, voice of SpongeBob. You had Mark Hamill. Um, right, yeah. who was yeah. in there Fred Tattershaw like these giants and you have no idea at the time yeah. who you're really doing you know the scene with or who your cast members are because of re all recording uh, uh, separately so yeah. there's always those little magic moments I think when when a production's finished um, I did a film uh, a French film um Terra Willy. It was changed its name to Astro Kid, but then it went back to Terra Willy. Right. Uh, and it's on Am it's on Amazon at the moment. And it that was a wonderful surprise. I played a droid called Buck. He was a uh, survival droid, and it was only two of us in the movie mm. uh, for the most part. Yeah. Um, and uh, we were stranded on a on a, a alien planet. And that was a lovely surprise because I went in and I did all the uh, the recordings for Buck's lines because, of course, they're originally in French. And when that came out, I mean, it's beautiful because, again, when we go in to do voiceover, we're either doing just what they call scratch, which is, you know, uh, uh, just wild lines. Yeah. Um, there's no animation to speak of. If there is, it's very rough and raw. Yeah, um, but yeah. generally there's no animation right. to look at because mm. uh, they're animating to our voice. So that uh, that movie, Terror Willy, when I finally saw that, oh my gosh, it was beautiful. It's made by uh, Tat Productions, T A T Productions in in um, France. Right, beautiful work. They're doing incredible animations right now. Yeah, right? yeah. If you don't know of them, check them out. Um, and that was incredible. And also Piney the Lonesome Pine, when I had nothing other than a, a picture of the character and a few character, you know, a few uh, um, uh, scene boards, you know, yeah. this is the village and this is this. But when that came out, I mean, you know, just flabbergasted. So I think in answer to your question, we don't get to see the goods until you do really, you right. know, that's, yeah. that's the surprise for us when we yeah. see it finished. Cause we don't see, 
you know, we don't see anything as a voice actor. We don't sort of walk on set and think, wow, look at that. It's the Millennium Falcon. Yeah. Um, <laughs> we don't get those wow moments until yeah. it's all done and wrapped up and in the theaters or on TV yeah. or, you know, so that's, yeah. uh, we, we share the magic with you guys in that yeah. respect. That must be great though, being able to sort of do it at the same time, you know, share, sharing it with everyone else, you know, that must be great. Yeah, it's always, it's always really exciting. Um, yeah. I'm just waiting for, I just did um, uh, a trailer for uh, Warhammer uh, as Techless um, and they're doing a, a, a really, they do some fantastic work, um, a creative assembly for Sega for the Warhammer series. They do some incredible animations and they're, I'm just waiting um, to do or for this trailer to drop with Techless. Right. Um, which will be quite exciting. Yeah. Um, so yeah. it's stuff like that. I'm like, oh my gosh, is it going to be like the other trailer? And they're like, yeah. And I'm like, oh, I can't wait, you know. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. So, so my excitement's there as well with, yeah. with you on that one. Well, I've got one final question <laughs> also because I've only got 10 minutes left. Otherwise, I need to upgrade to Zoom Pro, which I had no <laughs> idea about. <laughs> I know um, that one. <laughs> But no, I just I was sort of wanted to end with, is there one sort of piece of advice that you can sort of give to young people such as myself, sort of young, aspiring, whether they're voiceover artists, filmmakers, actors, people who are trying to sort of, you know, go, this is what I want to do for my life. This is my dream. And I want to get there. What's, what piece of advice do you have for people? Well, we live in one of the most exciting times for creators, and that is technology. And you have now the capability of, I mean, this new iPhone 14, they've put it up against a red camera, which is one of these, you know, 8K, incredible 30, $40,000 cameras. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I'm telling you, you put that iPhone on c cinematography mode, <laughs> it's unbelievable. You yeah. have got, you have now got a studio in your, in the palm of your hand, literally. Mm. Yeah. You've got TikTok, you've got a channel. You can create a channel instantly. You've got an audience instantly. You've got the technology to record voice, uh, record images as good as any studio. Mm. Yeah. So yeah. my my advice to anyone now is don't wait. I had to, you know, when I started off sort of 20 odd years ago, you know, it doesn't seem a long time ago, 20 odd years, but, you know, I had to rely on studios i had to go to television stations i had to to make a reel and, and yeah. post it and mail it and all this sort of stuff and yeah. now you don't have to do that so you know first and foremost i would say you know just start experimenting creating whether it's voices characters film uh, short films get your buddies together yeah. Um, you, you know, I see so many people now shooting commercials, uh, just taking any products and shooting. And now they're getting approached by massive brands to do yeah. their work because they followed their passion. They use the technology, which we all have now mm. um, to some degree and, and just put it out there. TikTok probably is at the top of that list now in terms of eyeballs. Yeah. And and what's important as well, just one last thing, is that the industry always have their bead on where the eyeballs are. And, and, you know, people spend many, many hours, maybe too many hours on social media, but on, yeah. on TikTok specifically. And that's where they're going to go. They're yeah. going to follow. And that that goes for, the you know, uh, everyone, movie makers television advertisers you know the advertising industry is changing rapidly because you know the old format's not working because yeah. people aren't watching them you know yeah. but they are watching tiktok um yeah. you know so uh, that would be my my one sort of takeaway fantastic that's brilliant well as i said it's been an absolute honor and a pleasure to chat with you today thank you so much for sort of taking the time to do this it's been absolutely fantastic thank you for answering all my questions as well oh pleasure pleasure connor anytime mate thank you so much cheers all right